Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, a CRISPR-powered NGS library prep to improve viral, bacterial, and host transcript detection in shotgun metagenomic sequencing. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Jump Code Genomics. To learn more, visit jumpcodegenomics.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits please click on the Continuing Education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, John Armstrong, Vice President of Research and Development, Jump Code Genomics. John, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, my name is John Armstrong. I'm the VP of R&D at Jump Code Genomics, and today I'm going to be telling you about a CRISPR-powered NGS library prep which improves viral, bacterial, and host transcription detection in shotgun metagenomic sequencing. Next generation sequencing has evolved into a powerful tool for genomic discovery, and it's lowered the cost and increased throughput. Unfortunately, much of that sequencing power is spent decoding biologically uninformative sequences. So refining NGS libraries by removing those sequences refocuses that power of the sequencing on biologically relevant content, and this can lead to greater insights and in identification of novel transcripts or variants. So total RNA, RNA library prep and ribosomal depletion is completed through seven steps and is less than a day. Uh, CRISPR clean depletion is performed after adapter ligation. The CRISPR Cas9 complexes are formed with a pool of designed guide RNAs, and the complexes are mixed with the adapter ligated cDNA library. After the unwanted sequences are cut, they cannot be substrates for PCR amplification and sequencing, and this, the result is a refined NGS library. Uh, this approach can be used across a number of applications you see at the bottom of the slide. And today I'll show data on several of these applications with a focus on infectious disease surveillance. So you can see here uh, a blown up schematic of the, of the digestion section of the protocol. We essentially have adapter ligated molecules. We can then use CRISPR as a molecular scissor to cut those molecules up. Any molecule that's not contiguous uh, does not go through the PCR process. And thus, after following PCR amplification and cleanup, we have an, a refined NGS library. So this next section of data that I'm going to show focuses on the removal of ribosomal RNA from bulk RNA libraries. And it employs Jump Code's full solution, which is our library prep and depletion kit. The data shows, it basically shows the tech works, that's why I'm showing it to you, but ultimately it sets the stage for further development around infectious disease detection. On the left, we're showing the depletion of ribosomal content using uh, CRISPR clean from human, mouse, rat, cow, dog, and chicken. We used control total RNA from those uh, organisms to apply our depletion technology. And you can see, although the percentage of ribosomal RNA differs in the mock or untreated sample, uh, we are highly or heavily removing the ribosomal RNA from these samples down to 5% or less. On the right side, the graph on the right, you can see that if we, if we calculate the rate of ribosomal depletion, which is simply the percentage of mock in the sample minus the percentage of depleted ribosomal divided by the mock, you can see here that we have greater than 90% ribosomal RNA depletion across these organisms. Next, we took universal human reference total RNA 
and we used it as an input to our library and depletion kit at uh, increasing amounts. So we went from one nanogram to 100 nanograms, and then uh, with the resulting sequencing data are able to calculate the number of genes on the y-axis that we see it at one read count or 10 read counts or greater. And you can see here that the, uh, that the number of genes discovered is very high uh, for each of the inputs and is also comparable, showing that the, the method and platform that we're using here with CRISPR depletion is, uh, is consistent and robust across this input range. In those UHR libraries that I just, or sorry, the UHR samples that I just showed, we spiked in ERCC controls uh, at each of those inputs. I'm only showing on the left side here the 5 nanogram input and the 100 nanogram input. But what we're able to do is to look at the, uh, the counts for the ERCC controls in a depleted library versus an undepleted library to understand uh, to what extent the method of the CRISPR clean technology, to, to what extent that injects noise into the system. And you can see here that when comparing the counts between a depleted library and an undepleted library at 5 nanogram input, a very high R squared and strong linearity of signal across the ERCCs. This is showing consistency here uh, and very little technical noise uh, or method noise being injected into the system. And also we see that same linearity hold at 100 nanograms of input as well uh, with a, uh, a depleted and an undepleted library. On the right side, the graph here, we're looking here at the, at the gene counts, not the ERCC counts, but the gene counts of the, of the human genes in the UHR sample for 100 nanograms of RNA input on the y-axis and 5 nanograms of RNA input on the x-axis. And you can see here that the, uh, that the linearity holds true for human genes as well uh, with an R squared of 0.99. On this slide, we're showing the results of looking at fold change of human gene expression, which helps to quantify noise. And here we're looking at the fold change between human gene expression at 5 nanograms and 100 nanogram library input. And the expectation is that uh, the signal should line up across the zero line if there is no fold change between the two different inputs. And as you can see here, that ex expectation is met showing total input RNA has little to no effect on noise. So as I mentioned in the previous slides, the uh, platform slides for the technology and our full solution, um, you know, I covered the percentage and rate of depletion across different organisms, as well as the stability of ERCC spike-ins at different inputs. And finally, the uh, consistency of human gene expression across different inputs as well. Uh, now that I've shown that data, I want to move on to show the in vitro use of the CRISPR-Cas system and how it improves detection sensitivity of metagenomics NGS. Before I show any data, I first want to show the study design we employed. We use COVID samples for the study design. Of course, the COVID genome is serving as a proxy for any infectious disease here, but COVID samples are relatively easy to get a hold of right now. We use 60 nasal pharyngeal samples, 45 COVID positive, ranging in cycle threshold values from RT-PCR from 16 to 39, and we had 15 COVID negative samples. Each one of these was split into three. Uh, where one uh, consisting of one control and two replicates for depletion. Each one of these then went through sequencing library construction and depletion. Uh, so we had 180 samples there. Moved into sequencing, sequencing at 2 by 150 bases, and then downsampling the data to 80 million reads or 40 million clusters. We then employed a five-prong analysis approach using IDSeq for pathogen detection, SARS genome assembly, NIAID priority pathogen assessment, and GSED clade identi identity uh, for the genomes. We use STAR for alignments and GATK for variant calling. Kraken2, uh, we used as a CAMER-based uh, system for interrogating the composition of the samples. 
uh, a pipeline called DGEN-R for differential expression for host response, and then also custom in-house pipelines for computing depletion rates, where we use the SILVA database, which is a compendium of all known ribosomal RNA sequences. I'm going to show data from each of these uh, analysis today. First, I'm showing the performance of the CRISPR Clean Plus system for depletion of ribosomal RNA. Uh, we've taken a subset of the samples from the 60 sample set, and we're showing here a COVID negative on the far left, uh, moving up through uh, the cycle threshold values from 16 to 38, showing a total of seven samples here. You can see that uh, the nasal pharyngeal samples, the, the, the percentage of mapped reads to ribosomal RNA, which is shown on the y-axis here, um, the percentage of mapped reads varies from sample to sample, but we are very effectively able to reduce the ribosomal uh, content from the human, uh, from human ribosomal RNA and from bacterial ribosomal RNA uh, in these samples. So what we're showing in this slide is our ability to call a COVID genome strain as well as detect the COVID genome using IDSeq and then next strain for the strain calling. You can see that the samples here that are in green in the table, um, these are samples that we have been able to call the strain. And, and what we mean by that is, are we calling the strain of, of the COVID genome through next strain uh, far down the clade tree? and do the replicates uh, for those samples both, um, or for the, the replicates have the same strain call, uh, showing consistency there. And you can see down to approximately a cycle threshold of 30, uh, we are getting a confident strain call for these samples. Next, um, when we think about simply detecting the COVID genome, not necessarily calling the strain, but detecting it and thinking about detection of infectious diseases in the future, things that we may not know what the genome sequence is and, and we're unable to call a strain, but we know enough of the genome that we can detect it. You can see here that we're able to push the level of detection down um, or push it up to a uh, cycle threshold of around 36. How we define that as detected and not strain called is that each of the replicates may not share the same strain call or there's been enough genome sequence for, uh, for IDSeq to assemble contigs of the genome, but there's not enough for next strain to confidently call that strain, and thus it places it simply on the trunk of the clade tree, which is the 19A, essentially. Um, so here you can see we're able to, uh, with um, simple, metagen simple metagenomic uh, NGS, uh, shotgun sequencing, and the CRISPR-Clean Plus application, to drive our COVID detection all the way down to a CT of 36. Those are very exciting results. As I mentioned earlier, this data is also downsampled to 80 million reads or 40 million clusters. And, uh, and so um, um, th this is a modest amount of sequencing when thinking about today's cost of sequencing. Next, using in-house and custom pipelines, we can look at things like What's the breadth of COVID uh, genome coverage or breadth of assembly that we could derive from our sequencing data downsampled to 80 million reads? And what's the depth of genome coverage and how is that affected by cycle threshold? So you can see on the left here that we're seeing 100% genome coverage of the COVID genome um, up to about a cycle threshold of 27. And then we see that decrease um, as we uh, move beyond 27 up to 32 and then um, going down below 10% genome coverage as we move into cycle thresholds of 35 and higher. Of even more interest is our depth of coverage, and, and, and why I mention that is because of the linearity that we see of the depth of coverage here uh, versus cycle threshold. And thus, we, in some ways, we have the ability to pin our average genome coverage uh, to a cycle threshold. Uh, and this is, this is interesting uh, for, in a number of ways. But um, here, also, just to mention, I'm showing an average of the replicates here. And, um, and you can see that even up to, um, up to a level of, say, of 33 or 32 uh, CTs, we're still obtaining greater than 1x depth of coverage uh, across the COVID genome. In the next four slides, I'm going to spend some time showing some data around composition. Uh, this is using our Kraken pipeline as well as some information from IDSeq. As I mentioned earlier, 
the COVID genome in the study um, can be thought of as a proxy as well for other infectious diseases, things that could be emerging um, or things that are already known about. But um, understanding what additional information we can gain around composition using the CRISPR-Clean Plus approach, I think, is, is high value. And here, again, we're showing the seven samples that we've been zooming in on. And ultimately, as you can see from the breadth and depth of coverage graphs I showed you earlier, are really representative of, of the whole set of samples. But when we look at something like a mock sample, which essentially has no depletion, and that goes through a metagenomics shotgun sequencing approach. You can see here that the bacterial species identified are anywhere around 2,500 to 3,500 bacterial species. But when we then apply the depletion approach, we can see that now that we're removing those ribosomal reads that were previously there, because we remove those ribosomal reads before they ever make it on a sequencer, we're now then opening up sequencing real estate to reads that were uh, previously unsequenced in the mock samples, and now we're driving additional coverage not only over bacterial species that we already have seen, but also bacterial species that before were hidden in the noise. And now we're bringing up anywhere between, you know, another 1,000 or 500-fold bacterial species in this sample. This in increases the sensitivity of discovery. And it also increases your ability to discover new things about these samples that you may not have known before. Uh, things that could serve as biomarkers or things that can serve as potential um, identification for co-infections or for other types of infections um, that, uh, that uh, may not be related to what this person is actually presenting for. And this slide is showing exactly one of those samples where we have a, a COVID negative patient, or sorry, a code, somebody that's COVID negative and they're going in to have a test done because they believe they may have COVID. And we can see from the, from the shotgun sequencing data that this is a rhinovirus A in this negative sample. It's the highest scoring component in both replicates from IDSeq. And rhinovirus A is the, it's one of the most common viral infectious agents in humans, and it's the predominant cause of a common cold. So it could be assumed from this that this is one of, one of the reasons uh, that this person uh, went in to get a COVID test, but we're able to detect this. And if, um, uh, you know, under the state of doing an RT-PCR or even using a, a, a primer set directed towards COVID, this is something that you would not pick up in the sample. And again, here's another example. We see that um, a co-infection in a COVID positive sample. So this is sample 403. Um, the CT value of this sample was 26.53, showed up as a strong positive. Uh, but again, in here, rhinovirus C co-infection in both replicates with an extremely high score from IDSeq. And again, uh, cause of common cold. This is a co-infection. You can see, again, uh, a good breadth and depth of coverage over the rhinovirus uh, genome here. And so here, now we're detecting co-infections in a COVID positive sample. And here we're showing an example that's a little bit more exploratory, uh, but this uh, sample showed up with um, a high score for uh, this, um, this uh, virus called um, babesiosis. It is a virus that's related to malaria, and um, it uh, has a one to four week incubation period, uh, but the symptoms include fever, uh, general, uh, general feeling of ill health, fatigue, and loss of appetite. And again, you can see down below here in both of the replicates that we have, um, we have uh, significant genome coverage shown. And, um, and albeit, this may not be the reason that they presented for a COVID test, but at the same time, um, this uh, shows that from an exploratory standpoint, we're able to increase discovery in these types of samples uh, using the CRISPR-Clean Plus uh, approach. So I'm going to spend the next couple slides talking about host response. We undertook an analysis or transcriptional analysis of using the human gene content in these samples, something that you could not do unless you're doing a uh, shotgun metagenomics approach. Um, but I'm going to talk about um, uh, some of the findings from this. But 
Um, really, we wanted to center on ana our analysis on can we find pathways that may be involved in, um, in the host response to uh, these infections. And so in that way, we were able to analyze uh, COVID negative, the 15 COVID negative, uh, versus a subset of, the, of, of COVID positive samples. First, I wanted to take just a second to show you the large amount of information that's been generated around host response uh, with regard to COVID infection. You can see here, these are papers, um, recent papers, you know, around the immune and metabolic signatures of COVID-19 and immune signatures linked to severity, uh, diagnostic host response biosignature from RNA profiling of nasal swabs and um, host viral infection maps with signatures for severity of COVID-19. Um, you know, this type of interrogation of the host response with regards to an infection uh, obviously has been extremely important with, with regards to COVID-19. But also, it will continue to be extremely important as we move forward and we have new strains come online of influenza, or even when we think about you know, with this data with regards to the next pandemic, uh, to be able to uh, take a look at host response and understand these signatures for the next pandemic and do it as quickly as possible um, is going to take a shotgun metagenomics approach. And also it's going to take a methodology uh, that removes the noise and, um, and makes the signals more clear. And so what we've done here is we took the 15 COVID negative samples, even though they may have presented with a cold or other things like that, we still take the COVID negative samples. And then we took um, the COVID positive samples that were less than a CT of 22, which were 29 samples. From those, we're able to generate, um, or sorry, perform a differential expression analysis uh, using DGNR. Uh, from that, uh, we uh, found a uh, signature of 100, around 150 genes, uh, and then we're able to look at those genes within gene ontology pathways. And you can see here on the left, the upregulated terms in the COVID positive samples strongly related to immune system. So we've got T cell chemotaxis, regulation of natural killer cells, macrophage migration, macrophage chemotaxis, lymphocy lymphocyte chemotaxis. This one has a, a very, very, very significant p-value. Eosinophil migration, eosinophil chemotaxis. All of these movements of immune cells, uh, migrations and things like that. Um, so we're easily able to identify uh, with statistical significance um, these upregulated pathways in the uh, COVID positive samples versus the COVID negative samples. By the way, we did this with no underlying metadata. We did not have any metadata concerning the severity of the patient's response to the COVID uh, in, in the positive samples, the severity of their response. And we didn't have any metadata around the negative samples. And in fact, as we know from looking at one of the samples that has rhinovirus in it, that these were not true negatives that were taking, taken from people that had no symptoms at all whatsoever, yet still, with, uh, with the lack of meta information, we're still able to find these, these statistically significant uh, upregulated immune pathways in the COVID positive samples. And so hopefully thus far, the uh, presentation has, has, has spurred on some thoughts about how you might be able to use um, uh, the jump codes uh, solution for your own research or for other questions. And, and certainly we think that way as well in R&D, um, sometimes good and sometimes bad. But um, I'm going to show a couple slides around other applications we've applied this to. And, and, and these may be things that you've, you've thought about or were potentially going to ask questions about. So hopefully I can answer some of those now. So in the CRISPR Clean Plus approach, we were using guides designed um, against the human uh, ribosomal, uh, non-coding ribosomal RNA, as well as the bacterial ribosomal RNA, and we want to be depleting those transcripts. But in the case of single cell and isoseq, um, because those approaches are poly-A based, um, at least right now, 
Uh, we want to be thinking about uh, the reduction of, of other gene types uh, since the contribution of, of non-coding ribosomal is very small. And in this case, we're really focusing our attention, at least um, for some of this initial data, on the uh, mitochondrial coding and ribosomal coding transcripts. And, uh, and so for um, our single cell set, initially we have um, what we call our 90-10 set, you, uh, takes the top 10 uh, coding mitochondrial genes and the top 90 coding ribosomal genes, and then we have guides designed towards those for depletion. And here we're showing the application of that 90-10 ribomyto guide set to uh, coronary artery a single cell sequencing and pulmonary artery single cell sequencing on the 10x chromium platform across multiple patients. You can see here that when uh, employing these guides for depletion in these sample types within the 10x library workflow, that we're, we're generating extremely high rate of depletion. We're destroying greater than 90% of those transcripts in there, thus opening up more space um, for sequencing of informative transcripts and uh, for the potential of identifying additional cell types. We've also applied these guide sets and methodology to the 10X Visium system. You can see here on the left side the tissue slices or the imaging of the tissue slices where we have the depleted on the far left and the control next to that. You can see that as we look down through the, the two mitochondrial genes and the two uh, ribosomal genes, uh, that are lighting up in the control. We're re greatly removing those in the depleted sample. Um, on the right side here in the violin plots is simply showing the same thing, except uh, in more of a, uh, a quantitative way uh, where you can see that we're um, in, the, in, the, in the CRISPR samples, uh, the signals from those, the, those transcripts are completely going away. The number of reads are, are completely going away in those as well. And so, you know, the depletion of these targeted regions is significant and the depletion across samples is significant. And as I mentioned before, when we're removing these transcripts prior to them going on a sequencer, we then open up that area on the sequencer to reassign reads that would have originally gone to these transcripts or gone to these genes. And we're now reassigning those reads to other genes uh, that, are, that are gonna be more informative. And so here we've also taken and applied this same methodology to um, the uh, uh, ISOSeq on the PacBio platform using a 10x chromium library system. And um, uh, you can see here as we look across these single cell ISOSeq samples where we have sample um, A and sample B and we have RPL and RPS which are ribosomal targets. Uh, for each of those, and then the MT, which is our mitochondrial targets for each of those, that we're, uh, those originally made up around 15% of all of the data in these samples. And then once we depleted, uh, those went down uh, to nearly zero. Um, so freeing up 15% of that data on a PAC bio system for informative reads. And you can see here that, that the depletion has little effect on, on anything library re related. So the read link differences uh, between the bulk and the single cell ISOSeq actually match with the library sizes uh, pre-sequencing. Uh, so there's, there's, there's no effect that we're seeing there of the method. Uh, I think one of the interesting questions we can ask is on a PacBio SQL2 system where you're generating around 4 million long read uh, zero mode waveguides, what if we could deplete in such a way that you could double the usable reads per flow cell? So you, um, in this case, uh, you know, we're freeing up um, somewhere around, um, you know, 600,000 additional reads that are informative. But what if we could free up 2 million additional reads that are informative? Uh, and this is something that we're going after currently. And, uh, and we think we can do it. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for their time and attention today. I really appreciate it, and I'll open it up for any questions. Thank you again. Thank you, John, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. Joining us today is Keith Brown, founder and chief technical officer of Jumpcode Genomics. 
If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, can this tech or method be applied for other infectious diseases other than COVID? Uh, yeah, the answer is uh, yes, it's an agnostic test, uh, so it doesn't require any a priori knowledge of, of what you're looking for. Um, really, that's the benefit of next generation sequencing is that you'll um, at least theoretically in interrogate every molecule in a sample. Um, the problem with next generation sequencing is that you interrogate every molecule in a sample, so uh, biology comes in the way. In the example shown here was uh, ribosomal sequences and overabundant housekeeping host transcripts that don't, uh, you know, provide informative information for, you know, really anything, uh, including host response. So, um, yes, uh, known or unknown, it's, uh, the concept is zero day capabilities, meaning on day zero of an outbreak, uh, can we use this technology to, uh, you know, identify and assemble uh, uh, the pathogen genome uh, within 48 hours? Great, thank you. Next question. Does depletion increase read counts across other things in the sample in an even or uneven way? Uh, in, in an even way, um, typically that has to do with the library construction process itself. If you have a good uh, complex library you've generated, uh, minimizing PCR amplification, um, you typically see about uh, a tenfold increase, at least with um, you know, the 13,000 guide sets that were used in the uh, metatranscriptomic study presented here, um, knocking those out, uh, which is roughly 90% of the uh, reads in the sample, uh, you get on average a, a tenfold increase across all uh, non-targeted uh, um, species. Thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question. Does sequencing to greater depth provide higher sensitivity for variant calling or COVID detection? Um, so far, what we've seen is that it does not. Um, as John presented here, uh, each sample was downsampled to 40 million clusters or 80 million 2 by 150 paired end reads. Um, some of the samples were sequenced to well over um, 50, 60 million clusters or over 100, 120 million reads. And by adding those additional reads uh, back in, uh, what we see is you get an increase in depth of the same locations uh, of the COVID genome, not necessarily an increase in breadth. Uh, and what we're looking to uh, determine right now is um, how much additional depletion uh, gives you an increase in sensitivity, uh, not only to detect, but to uh, uh, cover more of the COVID genome. And we hope to publish that data soon. Great. Well, thank you again, John and Keith, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Jump Code Genomics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions, questions we did not have time for today, and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.